Dear guests, dear participants, and dear colleagues, we have snow here in Sofia, and I think that this is an excellent time for a conference like this. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Oleg Muskerov, and I'm the director of the International Center for Mathematical Sciences in Sofia. I am honored and really happy to welcome you today to the second international conference Women in Mathematics in Southeastern Europe. And our event is aimed on promoting European cooperation in mathematics toward enhanced opportunities for women for women in the mathematical sciences. So we look for, toward increasing numbers of female faculty members in the mathematical sciences, improving mentorship of female graduate students and creating vital recruitment mechanism for future female graduate and undergraduate students. Uh, our International Center, ICMS, is affiliated with the Institute of Mathematics and Informatics of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences which is providing the infrastructure for the activities of the center. So I would like to introduce Professor Peter Boyvalenkov, the director of the Institute, to welcome you and to open the conference. Please, Peter. Thank you, Oleg. Uh, so it's great uh, uh, honor and pleasure for me to open the conference. Uh, our Institute is uh, happy to host for second time this conference, despite virtually, uh, we will have uh, uh, welcome to uh, invited speakers, uh, Nadia Morozova and Barbara Dezemšek, uh, and uh, several other uh, also uh, distinguished speakers. We are particularly uh, happy with the Bulgarian participation by Professor Kasparian and Professor Soskova. Uh, we expect uh, interesting talks, uh, good uh, survey parts and good new results. Uh, so good luck to, to the conference and uh, therefore I declare it open. Thank you very much. Yeah. So now I give the floor to Professor Milusheva, who is the Deputy Director of the Institute, to say uh, shortly some, something to the participants. Thank you, Oleg. Good morning, everybody. Please. Good morning. Uh, first, I would like to thank all the speakers for accepting uh, our invitation to give talks at this uh, second edition of uh, Women in Mathematics in Southeastern Europe. And especially, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers, Nadia Morozova and Barbara Drinovšek, and uh, to assure them that uh, their presence at this conference of ours is an honor for us. Unfortunately, our first distinguished speaker, Professor Mina Teicher, who is the director of Feminine Euter Institute for Mathematics, cannot attend the opening of the conference because uh, she's in Miami now and now it's three o'clock during the night. Otherwise, uh, she would be very happy to greet all participants in this uh, conference. Uh, I would like also to say that uh, the distinguished speakers for the next edition in 2022 will be Anna Maria Fino from University of Torino, Italy, and Sofia Lombropolo from Greece, who are also high-level mathematicians from uh, well-known scientific institutions and uh, we hope that they will attract a wide audience. We sincerely hope that uh, this initiative, Women in Mathematics in uh, Southeastern Europe, will achieve its goal, which was mentioned by Professor Moskarov, uh, to promote the role of female mathematicians and to create uh, long-term collaborations among scientists in Southeastern Europe. We also hope that this series of conferences uh, we will attract uh, young researchers from this region. And finally, I really hope that uh, the next one will be held in Sofia on LIF, and uh, I will have the opportunity and the pleasure to meet you face to face uh, next year in Sofia. 
I wish you fruitful discussions in the next two days. And we'll give again the floor to Ludmil Katsarkov, uh, who will present uh, our first distinguished speaker, Nadia Morozova. The first speaker is uh, Nadia Morozova from CNRS France. And um, so she can be uniquely characterized as the only molecular biologist who really understands the notion of connection and gauge transformations. So she also is, has worked with uh, some uh, uh, really spectacular mathematicians like Mikhail Gromov, Christophe Soule, and Bob Penner, as you can see, representing uh, Russian, French, and American school in the best <laughs> mathematical schools in the best way possible. So I think that the influence of uh, Gromov was uh, really demonstrated today with no doubts. And so uh, without any further ado, let me lay on you uh, a friend of mine of many, many years, Nadia Murazova. Nadia? <laughs> I'm very grateful for Ludmil for such a nice presentation. I will tell you about one of the corridors uh, of mass biology interface in which I work. And, and uh, I will tell you about mathematical model of cancer cancer stem cells population behavior. Of course, I will give you some <laughs> uh, important biology uh, because mathematical modeling of the process is mathematical tools on one side and biological problems on the other side. I need to apologize that my mathematics here will be not as complicated, as excited, as um, sophisticated as all my friends and <laughs> Uh, scientific colleagues uh, do in their mathematical work. The main art in mathematical model of biological process is to find, to take an adequate biological problem and to reformulate it in proper mathematical way in order to solve this problem if bio bi biology can't solve it just by biological methods only. And then to find mathematical tools will, will, should be appropriate. And this is the main art. And I will try to show it today. I will show on two important, very important biological questions, which can't be solved in biology just by biological method. And uh, I will just say you now that it is two very interesting phenomena of cancer stem cells population. I will first need to tell you how to, like, the, main, the main problem is to, how to put it downstairs. I don't understand how I understand. Okay, so <clears throat> cancer stem cells, uh, what are them and what is the problems which biology um, would like to answer and come? Cancer stem cells initially were a small group in each cancer, which were named tumor-initiated cells. These um, tumor-initiated cells are, ah, you did not see how I show, yes or no? Uh, did you see how I show the, the points in the computer or I need to take my mouse? Yes, you need to take your mouse, I guess. I need to take my mouse to show something. So yes. you don't see how, if I do it in a live mode, okay? Like my mouse, my mouse, my mouse. Here is it, okay, I have it, oh, good. So tumor initiated cells initially were found experimentally by the ability to initiate tumor growth. And um, so they are most dangerous ones in the whole population and they um, re resistant to chemotherapy and radiotherapy treatment. Unlike all other cells in the population. But next it was reported that some other features, some other characteristics of these tumor initiated cells are similar to normal stem cells because of it they start to be named for many, many years for now cancer stem cells. Though in spite of them, pardon, in spite of the real fact 
that main characteristic of cancer stem cells are similar to adult stem cells, it is not sure if it is correct or not to name them stem cells. This is important issue because these characteristics by similar are asymmetric cell division with ability to cell renewing. You are mathematicians, for you asymmetric, it is something different. For biologists, this term asymmetric cell division means that one cell, which is stem cell, pardon, one cell, which is stem cell, produced two different cells. D differentiated in normal case, we say daughter in cancer cells because cancer prevent normal differentiation of cells. So stem cell in normal case provide two different cells and biologists name this asymmetric. You see how different are two fields and even the words in this field. Other cells non-stem, do just two similar cells. This is normal division. Other features is pluripotency, the possibility to produce not one, but different types of differentiated cells, small percentage in total cell population, and much more slow rate of cell divisions. And answer stem cells found by this ability, as I said, also share almost all of these features. At least 10 or more years ago, when they, this group of cells were found. But still from that time and more and more now, we have a question. So-called cancer stem cells and normal stem cells have more similarity or more differences. I need to say that we talk not about Embryonic stem cells, it is a different story. We talked about all these features, which I just told you. It is about adult stem cells, stem cells sitting in adult organism in each tissue, waiting for the necessity to replace the differentiated cells of this tissue. So uh, this is a very important question. And during the modeling, I will tell you a lot of interesting things can be said on this question as a reply on the question two. I almost finished the biological introduction. I just need to add that cancer stem cells can live in cell culture for many, many, many years. Uh, they can be frozen or replaced from flask to flask. And the percentage of cancer stem cells in each population is from around one or five percentage. Interestingly, this percentage is characteristic for each cancer cell line, for example, for breast cancer, for adenocarcinoma, and for different cell lines inside these uh, types of cancer. And this exact percentage supported for years during cultivation. It is very, uh, in, by itself, intriguing fact. And, how we know about it? Cancer stem cells can be identified according to specific molecular marker found just in the course of experimental work. Then cancer stem cells can be sorted in some machine according to this marker. So we can fish only the cells having this marker. And then this population could be purified so we can get 100% of stem cells and only stem cells and put them back in the flask, okay? So, and now I come to the first phenomenon. The absolutely intriguing phenomenon of stabilization of cancer stem cells population and cell culture. If we purify cancer stem cells, have a population 100%, 100% of stem cells, and put it in the flask and then monitor each day, each day, we monitor the percentage of cancer stem cells. And we see that in first several days, the population rapidly decreasing, then decreasing more slow, and then it's stabilized. It's stabilized and in, in, intriguing fact is that it's stabilized exactly in characteristic level 
characteristic percentage for each cell line. If we take cell line where it was one percentage, it will be stabilized not on five, not on three, not on seven, but on one. Or if it was one and a half, it will be exactly one and a half, and this will be supported next. So we see that the system, even such small uh, system as population of stem cells, or sorry, cancer cells, knows its structure and have some means to return to its structure and to stabilize it after perturbation, for example, the perturbation, which is purification. And uh, we can immediately see, even without any mathematics, just with logic, that to have this phenomenon of stabilization is impossible with classical scenarios about which I already tell you of cell behavior. If stem cells only replacing itself, producing D, and D quickly producing two cells, it is completely impossible to get this stabilization. The percentage chart should be decreasing and decreasing and more and more decreasing almost to zero in the question of percentage. So it is absolutely clear that we can think about only these two scenarios. And also we uh, have other important questions, biological questions, the main general one, what underlies the stabilization of cancer stem cell population? What scenarios of cell behavior exist, should exist in a given type of cancer in order to uh, implement the stabilization? And more precise question, which is very important for biologists, for cancer biology, for cancer medicines, first of all, when does non-stem to stem transition exist? So when the normal cells start to convert it back to stem, and stem, as we already know, has exactly the cells which initiate cancer growth. So this is a very important question. We will, of course, uh, touch it. For now, we will start with the second question. And uh, our goal is to find what scenarios of cell behavior exist in these cancer cells, the cancer cells for which experimentalists give us this measured curve of stem cell dynamics. Uh, what, when we talk about scenarios, we can, together with already discussed, usually suggested, add the ones which were reported in the literature, in experimental literature, and has a lot of um, discussion if they exist or not. This is our goal, to add all what we have from literature and to find what is real and what is just uh, experimental bias. So we have stem cells which divide symmetrically into 2D, stem cells which just symmetrically divide into S as normal division, but for S cells, and direct transformation from S to D, which is very, very often reported. And we can add the same for theoretically for D cells. However, we assume logically that um, it is not very well seen here. I will move the, the thing. How I will move it? One second. Pardon. Ah, by my, what the current mean? No, so we have the same four possibilities, uh, but we take only usually suggested. And the last one, assuming that D is supposed to convert first to S and then start some more uh, ad ad adequate behavior of S cells produ producing S. So we choose to have four scenarios, all four scenarios for S and only two possible scenarios for D. And yes, for mathematical modeling, we took only three main factors, we, all of them and only them determine, can determine cell population structure, we have our cell population of cancer cells. It is these patterns or modes or scenarios of cell divisions, also rates of cell division, quick or slow in different sub-populations, and the rates of cell death. 
This is three factors which we need to include in the model. And this model also applicable to normal adults themselves, which is important to know that it's the instrument, mathematical instrument we create, also applicable for this case, uh, though we start from answer. Uh, for each of these six scenarios, we, for each of six scenarios, which is written here like this, we add the probability or the frequency of this scenario in one um, round of um, experimental um, work, which means that in one round uh, of cell uh, behavior, one uh, in the time points we have in the um, experimental uh, curve. It is one day actually. So the, during one day, cells supposed to do something uh, or to die. We uh, assume from experimentalists that the speed uh, rate of divisions and deaths uh, should be constant, but different in D and uh, S cells. So we have six probabilities for here to here and constant measure by experimentalist rates of cell division and cell death in here you don't see but you can understand in both cases okay here now this is a system of rotation now it is very very simple and primitive and as you can see we have uh two system of equations because the curve of percentage measured um curve of percentage starts from measuring S cells at each time point and D cells in each time point. So we have DS over DT and DD over DT. We have, we start from very simple uh, differential equation, uh, depending on cell death for each cell, uh, for the scenario which produces cells, multiplied on the speed of uh, rate of division and uh, the same for D producing S. And the same idea for D, we have scenarios producing D, this and um, speed of corresponding uh, scenarios in S and D. Um, for this auditorium, I should not explain how to find the solution for this equation. It is a first undergraduate course. Uh, the only thing is that when we have this solution, we can put it as percentage of stem cells in total population. So we have uh, S plus D, uh, and uh, then we calculate percentage of S in S plus D. Uh, and then having this solution, we can analyze of this asymptotic stability by mathematical methods. Uh, this analysis uh, showed when we have the constant uh, coefficients in this uh, system of equation, uh, which means constant coefficient in the system biologically means that this stabilization is intrinsic characteristic of given cells, of given type of cancer. So, um, and many biologists start to think like this, but analysis of the results of this system show that the phenomenon of stabilization with the system with constant parameters can occur only having non-stem to stem cell transition. So this Q2 greater than zero, so we need definitely have this process. But this process in most biological labs is not confirmed experimentally. It is important fact. And also having our um, analysis for the exact concrete particular curves of different cell lines for adenocarcinoma, we found that even having this, it is impossible to fit the curve with any man, meaningful biologic, any me, meaningful constant parameters. For example, we should or include cell death, which is much, much greater than measured, or we need to include uh, cell division, which is much, much quicker in stem cells than in uh, D, which is not correct, and so on. So constant parameters in the equation can't exist. We can't uh, account on 
uh, intrinsic characteristic of cells, and we need to assume a time-dependent changing of parameters in the media due to some instructive signals. So this is a story which we will explore now. And as I say, according to what we have from biologists, we have an assumption that the rates are constant, division and dates, and the probabilities of scenarios changing this time. Now we have a more or less well formulated mathematical question, which is given the measured dynamics from experimentalists of percentage of cancer stem cells, is it possible to find functions PI of T, meaning probabilities or frequencies of each concrete scenario of cell behavior, and QEOT, which we decided to have two normal and non-stem to stem transition. So is it possible to find this function for a given constant set of uh, lambda uh, rates and gamma rates of corresponding division and death? Okay. So this is the mathematical question, and we start to have the same system of equation, but in this case, P probabilities are um, already depending on T, and the conditions which we have initially that the sum of all probabilities should be as long as their probabilities equal to one. So we have four equations. We need to determine six probabilities. So this is a part of art. Biology doesn't, can't give us any other information uh, to have any additional equation. What to do? So everything in this field uh, starts and uh, give, uh, give the result thanks to some hypothesis. In this case, the hypothesis is that the sum of all changes in cell behavior scenarios up to stabilization should be minimized at each step. No, this is very simple idea, but um, this is very, um, uh, this idea is biologically relevant because to change the scenario of division, for example, to change the mode of division from asymmetric to symmetric, or instead of division make perform, perform transformation, cells should prepare molecular machinery. And as small efforts it cell can um, invent in this is more logical, more easy for a cell. So we add this uh, um, request according to this hypothesis. And uh, you can, um, remember our simple system. So the system and together with this condition can be rewritten as in, in, in this form in a way that we have only three variables which we just can try, um, put in the new system from this information and um, According to the um, additional uh, hypothesis which we just invented, we can add these um, three equations uh, because, as I just showed, we see that we have only three uh, independent parameters which we which can next uh, determine three others, and then we have six equations for six. Um, variables and the solution next depends on initial condition if we can have it from biologists. Unfortunately, as I say, biologists are people who can do something and can't do something because of it they can't answer some questions and mathematicians are here in order to replace by some hypothesis and skills, mathematical skills, then um, uh, information which we can't get from biologists. Here, we don't know the initial conditions. In this case, the initial conditions is that how cells start to behave in the first moment and biologists can't measure it. So we provide as a solution by numerical simulation 
by computer program implementing the system which I just described, we provide the result where we have the po all possible corridors of probabilities for each scenario, sorry, having this curve, this measured curve, this measured curve, and uh, measured parameters lambda and gamma. And we um, give these corridors for all possible sets of initial conditions, which satisfy for all period of time, just the requested probabilities, of course, should be not greater than one and not smaller than cos zero. So uh, having our system, the solution of the system, all meaningful initial conditions which satisfy this request, we can get not one curve for each probability, but we have a set of changing with time curves of probabilities for each uh, scenario. This gives what we named corridors. Even in this corridor story, we can have answer on two interesting questions. Uh, first of all, we can see that we can see that in different uh, cases, these corridors are completely different. This is six different uh, cases with lines and parameters. And you can see this is the same. This is shadowed and this is not shadowed to see the boundaries. Yeah, this is equivalent. Uh, we can see how different they are and how in different cases, different scenarios um, changes and, and, um, and exist or disappear according to the concrete um, situation. But this is not so interesting. The most interesting thing, and I will show it more in module yeah, uh, later, that we talked about fact that initially in tumor initiated cells and cancer stem cells was it was reported that they also have only asymmetric cell division. And here on this big slide that is better visible, we can see that, okay, we have a very, very wide corridor of all possibilities of this scenario. And inside it is, it is a, a lot of curves, but the highest boundary is not greater than 70%. So whatever is this corridor, and this is in all uh, cases we check, whatever is this high, uh, sorry, wide corridor, we should assume that cancer stem cells, unlike normal stem cells, should have additional scenarios in their behavior um, in order to um, implement at least this stabilization or uh, in general in any perturbation. And uh, another point is that uh, we have Q1, it is a scenario for normal behavior of D cells. And we see that again, the highest boundary is not 100%. And it means that at least in this concrete case, in other is different, but in this concrete case, even if it is not seen experimentally, the non-stem to stem transition in the cells definitely should occur. We don't have another possibility. So this is two very important biological results about, in general, um, cancer stem cells situation. And again, we have, according to the model, a tool to see it in each concrete system having the measured line and measured biological parameters. Um, of course, it is next very important, again, mathematical question. Given a measured curve and parameters, what additional data are necessary and sufficient to get a unique solution in each case, so in unique solution in each corridor? Again, if we have at least one, we already have one chosen in each of six corridors. Yes, uh, this black is this black is not uh, is black is the uh, is black curve is a um, measured uh, dynamics and all others are 
uh, look what this is, pardon, this is Q1 and so on. Um, curves according to, uh, corresponding to scenarios. Uh, from our previous analysis, we can say that uh, these functions P, I, and Q, I of T is uniquely determined by the choice of initial conditions. We can have, as we said, only three initial conditions, but we can't have them from biology. What we can do, we can add a request for selection of conditions, maximizing in each case probability of asymmetrical stem cell division. This will show the situation uh, what the highest boundary for asymmetrical cell division, P1, is in each experimental case. And this I already told you, it is in all cases being maximized, not higher than 70%. Uh, more interesting is another selection, which can be done by minimizing probability of non-stem to stem transition, because we start from the fact that in most, most, most uh, cases, experimentalists can't see it by experimental work. And uh, in different cases, we can see that the minimal probability of Q1 in case of this uh, perturbation and stabilization, in some cases, it is very high. On the other hand, in some cases, I, again, this is not seen, I'm almost seen. In some cases, it is almost zero or zero. And this we can check uh, on our, using our model and numerical simulations, a computational problem, a program which can perform it. So uh, now we come to another question. What is the reason for changing of uh, spectrum of the scenarios of S and D cells behavior with time? And the hypothesis is that the set of biochemical signals, secreted factor, which are in the medium secreted by these and that cells, and then influence their behavior. And yeah. Dan? Hello? Hello? Maria Moroso, yes. I, 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 I can uh, ask if you have question, you can ask them right away in, immediately during, it's even better if you ask questions during the talk, not to be lost and to see the, the logic. So if you have any questions, I'm very happy to... to, to... No, 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 no. And so I just take this uh, I just take this time to say that if you have a question on the way which uh, prevent you from understanding and uh, switching you off from the um, line of uh, presentation, I will be very happy to answer them right away on the way. Uh, so if something not clear, you can not discussion question, but if something not clear, I will be happy to answer right now. Okay. So please don't hesitate to interrupt me if something not clear. So the question is that we have probabilities P and Q um, depending on the function uh, the <clears throat> uh, which are representation of secreted factors in the medium um, and how to determine these factors. Um, so... Um, We have a mathematical formalization of this cell-to-cell -cell communication. Um, we have more complicated uh, story about it, which I will not tell you today, but I will tell you more interesting story that um, we just have a question giving a set of unique functions of probabilities, PI and QI, is it possible to find a set of factors UK of T where we have 
an idea that we have at, at least k, k factors in the media influencing the behavior of, of scenarios, of probabilities, of cell behavior. So is it possible uh, to uh, find um, these factors responsible for the dynamics? And um, uh, we assume that we have the uh, unique uh, curve for each corridor. So we have six curves, six functions, PI of T and QI of T. And we suggest that the factor in the media uh, on which this um, scenarios, uh, behavior of scenarios depends should be in this form which corresponds to this uh, function. Why it is chosen? Because this function can account for almost all behavior of the factors in the media. Because uh, it appears at some moment, it stands at some uh, height for some period and then decreasing. So it can be quick, it can be uh, slow, it can be and can start at zero and so on. In this case, we have um, to understand the uh, amount and the shape, sorry, again, to, to, to calculate the amount and to shape of these factors, influencing the behavior of functions PI and QI, we can do the comp decomposition of functions over um, the functions, these functions UK. Um, so, um, in this case, we consider six our scenarios as one generalized function Y, and uh, we consider this uh, form of this function, and uh, because it depends on all important factors in the media, so um, K, the number of factors, could be different and this our model and our system exactly should detect and uh, coefficients a e k just depends the, um, show the uh, details of concrete factor while the uh, b which uh, responsible for the height of the of the um, Factor, um, formalized factor, uh, should account also for the influence of each factor on the height of the um, UT uh, function. And we assume that we can uh, calculate uh, the coefficient BK from BIK, assuming that it should be the maximal one from all. BIK because it can correspond to just a concentration of biochemical compound in the media. So this is why we do this assumption. And having all these assumptions, we define function UK as this in this form. BK again calculated according to this idea. Uh, now it doesn't move, sorry. Uh, this allows us, this allows us, this not allow us, okay, never mind. Don't understand why, no, sorry, ah, okay. Uh, this, no, da, ничего не окей. This allow us to find and this allow us to find uh, uh, the coefficients, sorry, the coefficients uh, which determine the shape and position of each factor. Uh, we do it by a simple square list method, which means that the function of this should be minimized. We um, uh, set coefficient m the 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 power of this uh, after numerical simulations and um, all um, uh, test experiments as six 
So we need only these three parameters of each, um, these three parameters for each um, putative uh, un secreted factor in the media. So this is just the calculation of uh, the, the uh, df over da uh, b and c ensure it to be equal to zero and we have a, a computational tool which can implement all this into the um, uh, computer code and then we can get thanks to it having this set of curves which are given from the previous uh, analysis of first part, which I already told you. And we have a prediction of the amount of K factors, the minimal amount of K factors, and their position and characteristics, for example, height, which implement these six curves of changing probabilities. Uh, in this case, we ask experimentalists to measure at the same time when they measure the percentage of cancer stem cells population existence day over day, to measure at the same day what amount of metabolites exist in the media. This can be done by additional experimental, very difficult, but possible work naming secretome or metabolome analysis. So we have the fluctuation of all uh, metabolic parameters in the media. It is very important because the amount of these parameters is, uh, sorry, about these factors is about 1,000. And to find out which ones, six or three or four, Para, uh, factors from 1000 influencing cell behavior, cancer cell behavior, so important cancer cells, which are so dangerous for our health. This is very important uh, work to do. And our tool exactly uh, predict this set of metabolite uh, because we can just see which of the uh, measured metabolites with the day-by-day -day dynamics corresponds to found predicted uh, behavior of uh, secreted factors. So, for example, here we can see that factor number five and the factor number six from this uh, small picture of possible seven uh, measured metabolites that this factor can be um, elucidated as very, very plausible from this comparison. Uh, I have three minutes to tell you about another phenomena, and I don't uh, want to speak about this phenomena today a lot. I just want to uh, show you in the end another interesting phenomena also connected with cancer stem cells behavior. Uh, this is phenomena of post irradiation induction of cancer stem cells from non stem cells. This is exactly this non stem to stem transition. And it was very well shown by the group of molecular biologists working on cancer cell in Marseille. The main story is that after radiation, which usually uh, used to kill the cancer and which kills most of cancer cells, as we said in the very beginning, cancer stem cells resist to this, but together with this, they found the phenomena that after radiation, non-stem cells start to be cancer stem cells. Some of them, if not die, they start to be induced, induced cancer stem cells. So the question was how to find out what is going on in this system and which scenarios are activated, disactivated, um, because of the fact that this is a curve 
which showed that real, uh, after decrease after radiation, then it is relapse phase, and then it is uh, escape phase, and then it is relapse phase. So the increase of cancers due to this phenomenon is very, is very uh, well documented, at least in this breast cancer line with which they work. Uh, so uh, just to explain uh, the results, uh, they have not, they have constructed cells which are in, initially non-stems and they are always like this because they put some marker in the chromosomes uh, and red marker to stem cells, okay? So this non-stem cells and this red is stem cells, okay? So, and they have measurements of stem and non-stem uh, dynamics in red cells. So we have stem and non-stem dynamics on red cells and the same in blue cells. And then they showed that after radiation, some of negative blue uh, cells, which are supposed to be negative, start to be positive. So they were collected like negative, they were marked with blue like negative, and then with um, time after radiation, they start to be um, positive according to stem cells marker. So this is, uh, this is uh, the most interesting group, but it connected with all other um, cells and their scenarios in their culture. So th we add the same system where scenarios depends on time, but here we put all type of scenarios because after radiation, it could be whatever, plausible, not plausible, and so on. And we also add as a scenario here a cell death. So now cell death is not constant. It is a one of scenarios and very important one because um, how cells dies after radiation and how they convert it into stem cells, it is the most interesting question according to the uh, question about all this phenomena. And uh, now we have two systems of equations for initially blue cells, so for blue cells initially non-stem and for red cells initially stems. I will not go into this is experimental measurements for them. I will not go deep to this point. I just want to say that this is the last slide. Sorry for small delay. Uh, I uh, can uh, show the uh, evolution of probabilities obtained from numerical simulation for um, solution of this uh, system of four equations. Uh, and we have the in all behavior of cell scenarios in the control, and we have this after radiation. And uh, I will finish with the phrase that the, all, this, all this data were found thanks to a numerical simulation, the, the solution was done by numerical simulation. Numerical simulation showed that this is the only uh, possible uh, scenarios which uh, can be done. And now we have a question, and if somebody wants to <laughs> participate in this discussion, not now, but later contacting me, I will be very happy, or even now maybe with suggestions, to discuss how we can uh, prove mathematically that the results which we got from solution of the system by numerical simulation is the unique one. We need to prove the uniqueness of our solution. And this is very important to be sure that this is the only way how cells behave after radiation. And we don't, we don't find a way to do it now. So if there will be some suggestions, I will be very grateful. And here I show how I'm grateful to my colleagues who helped me in this work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nadia, for the very clear talk. Any questions? No questions. <laughs> no questions, no suggestions. <laughs> oh.
Okay, so if there is no questions, I will be happy if somebody is interested in this um, discussion later, and I give the microphone to the next person. Now it's time screen? to start with the second talk uh, for today. Uh, this is the talk of Meral Tusun. She is from the Department of Mathematics of uh, Galatasaray University, Turkey. And her research interests are in the field of singularities in algebraic geometry. Meral finished her PhD in Marcel, France, under the supervision of Professor Le Dung Trang. And now she is going to give a talk on simple elliptic singularities and generalized Waddle Weisses. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank organizers and scientific committee members for inviting me for this talk. And it is uh, very important, uh, I think, uh, to think about women and to bring them together. Uh, I hope uh, in a few years we will not need any more uh, having special sessions and we will fight against uh, men mathematicians. And, uh, and I wish success to your new institute. Uh, today I will give a talk on the classification of singularities uh, using Lie algebras. Uh, after listening uh, the talk by uh, Nadia Morozova, uh, I thought uh, what we are, I am doing is uh, far from being useful at the moment. We hope that it will be, it will be useful in some years. And this is uh, one of my interests, in fact, uh, classifying Lie algebra uh, singularities. First of all, I would like to say some words about uh, singularities and varieties for those who are not doing algebraic geometry. Uh, we, I will consider uh, the polynomials in the, the ring of polynomials with coefficients in C, complex coefficients, and I try to see the roots of F which means I will have points in Cn such that when I replace in N in F, I get zero. This is the set of roots. And in algebraic geometry, we call it variety. Of course, we can get a system of equations and we try to, to solve a system, which means R polynomials, and we, tr we try to see what is the zero set, the common zero set of R polynomials. This is also called variety, but today I will be interested in only in case of one polynomials, F. And this is what is called variety. And what is singularity? Uh, we divide into the points of the variety. Uh, the points are called smooth points and singular points. Smooth points, what we are uh, trying to find, the, the points where we get the tangent space, as we know in analysis uh, classes. If we don't, we cannot define the tangent space, we call this point singular points. In other words, we take all the derivations for each uh, variable and we put a point P and the evaluation is zero for each I. This means that the tangent equation that we know is not working at the, that point. Or I can say for students that the implicit function theorem uh, is, doesn't hold at a singular point. So here I am interested in singular points of a variety. Especially, I am, we call this uh, Dinkin singularities or ADE singularities. 
which means we have this Dinkin or ADE or dual singularities. You can see in the literature all this name or rational double point singularities. These are my F in each case. And we are interested the zero set of this polynomial. What the zero set of this polynomial, if we take the derivative, you will see that the zero, zero, zero in C3 is a singular point of singularity or singular point of the variety F. For each F, the only singular point is origin. All others are smooth points. And if you do algebra or uh, representation theory, you know that there are some groups corresponding to these equations, which means that we take C2 and caution with one of these groups. And the, the, this equation appears as caution. That's why sometimes we call these singularities caution singularities. And the name of the singularities, according to the equation, we say AK minus one singularities, D singularities, E6, E7, E8 singularities. There are a few more, but today I am interested in only these five cases. That's because of these capital letters here, we say that these are ADE singularities or dual singularities uh, because uh, Patrick Duval proved that these are the only isolated singularities in C3, which means that the only singular point is the origin in C3. So the graph that you are seeing here, we have varieties and these varieties have a singular point. Sometimes I will call this variety X. And we apply some transformations to remove the singularity. We call this process resolution of the singularity. It is a sequence of blow-ups for those who knows how to do this. And we find Another surface, which is a, surf, a real surface, I mean, a surface of dimension two. And on this surface, we had, we have the curve configuration. And this curve configurations is represented by a graph. How do we do this? For each curve, let me call this curve for example, uh, CI, I will denote it by a vertex CI. If two of them, CJ, they intersect, I we put an edge between two vertices. This is the graph of the singularity. In fact, we do a, transform a sequence of transformations. We get a bunch of curves, which is connected in our case, and this curve corresponds to a graph. This is, that's why we call it dual graph. And this dual graph, we know for these five cases, which is not so easy for if we change the polynomial. So this is, uh, this relates, these singularities are very interesting because it relates representation theory, algebraic geometry, physics, and uh, many other domains of mathematics. They, <coughs> pardon, they have <coughs> very special properties. And today we will see one of it. And I said aim, today I will try to say that if we have a singularity here, but surface singularity, I concentrate myself in dimension two. It lives in CN, a complex surface. And I will 
try to see what are the Lie algebras. Of course, as you saw here, that we have some groups. And from this group, we can go to the Lie algebras. But here, I will use Grotendic Briscorn. Grotendic Briscorn theory to relate Lie algebras with our singularities. And this is what I called classification of singularities. And there is another relationship between these two things. And this is via root systems. And this is also another uh, uh, interesting classification. Uh, I hope next time I will say something for root systems, but today I will speak, uh, let me call this one and two. I will speak about the, the first uh, arrows. What is a Lie algebra? A Lie algebra is a vector space. And here I am interested in complex Lie algebra and finite dimensional Lie algebras. Lie algebras, we know that it is uh, a vector space with a Lie bracket defined on it. And we want that this Lie bracket satisfy three conditions, which is C by linear map, anti-symmetric, and this is called Jacobian identity. I will tell you quickly a simple Lie algebra that we all know. The set of matrices n by n, the square matrices, are a Lie algebra, is, and the Lie bracket defined is uh, here x, y are matrices, square matrices, and we define x, y minus y, x as the Lie bracket, and this Lie bracket satisfies the three conditions that I gave you. And it, it is a Lie algebra we, de, we denoted by G, L, and C with small letters. And with capital letters, you have the Lie group. And today, I said that I am interested in the variety defined by only one equation, the roots of one equation. And also, I am interested in this Lie algebra, which is SLNC, these are the square matrices with trace zero. This defines also Lie algebra with the same Lie bracket. And it's interesting because now I will use uh, to classify my singularities, uh, this Lie algebra. So, Keeping in mind that we have a Lie algebra, which is SLNC, I take a finite dimensional Lie algebra and we define the nilpotent variety. And now you know that the variety means for us the roots of some polynomials. And nilpotent variety is the adjoint map for each matrix is the nilpotent. This, you can think that there exists a positive number such that the, the, the power of this matrix is zero, the nilpotency condition. This is what I will call nilpotent variety. Why? Because if we take SL2C, trace zero, two by two matrices, NG will be two by two matrices with this condition. Because if you think that this is x, we know that x square is zero. Or you can think that we take the characteristic polynomial, each coefficients will be zero. This is the nilpotency. So if we take SL3C, the nilpotent variety will be defined with two equations. Before I told you that I am interested in only one equation, and here I will get one F1 equals zero, and from here F2 equals zero. So we have the common 
zeros of two polynomials, and this is a variety, nilpot I, we call it nilpotent variety of G in for SLN C and equal three cases. So now we don't, we, we know the dimension of this variety. As I said, I am interested in surfaces. To get a surface, first of all, let me say a few words about nilpotent variety because uh, uh, nilpotent variety is not always interesting. Interesting in the sense of singularity theory because we are looking for varieties having some singular points. And here, uh, Lie Al with, if we take a Lie algebra and NG is isomorphic to C to the K, in this case, we will say NG is trivial, which means we have no singularity, all points are smooth. So these are not interesting for me. We prove with Nakamoto that if G is a solvable Lie algebra, and G is always trivial. So this makes a big restriction for looking interesting uh, algebras to classify singularities. I will not go to details for solvability, uh, but uh, I will tell you a few words for the nilpotent variety of SL3C. We said that the nilpotent where uh, this algebra is eight dimensional. We know that it is defined by uh, the, the dimension in general is n square minus one. Mm -hmm. And here we have two equations and we know that dimension of ng is six. I prefer to get a surface to relate with my ADE singularities. That's why for this, we should intersect our variety NG with some hyperplanes. And this is called transversal slice, this hyperplane. This is a local subspace of G. And we try to take NG intersection S we call a generic slice or transversal slice or nice slice if we get by the intersection a surface with an isolated singularity. And Slodovi gave a description to write directly this slice. And he used uh, for, this des for his description uh, this Morozov Jacobson triples and how it he defines. Uh, this is defined, you know, we, you take a matrix. You can think that I am talking about Lie algebra of matrices and the nilpotent variety of this Lie algebra. So you consider a matrix X in the nilpotent variety, and there, there exist two other matrices such that the Lie bracket is two times the first matrix minus two times the second one and the H. If you know the Lie algebra theory, this will be the generating uh, element for Cartan sub algebra. And when you find this X, Y, H, we call this SL2 triple or Morozov Jacobson triples, X, Y, H. So these are special elements in the Lie algebra. And Slodovy says that if you want to find a surface uh, from a Lie algebra, which is of type ADE that I show you at the beginning, he says that you will find X, Y, H, which are SL2 triple, and you will take the y in your triple and you take the centralizer of y in g. Centralizer, this is the definition as in algebra. 
the set that you will define as the sum of X plus the elements of the centralizer is called a Slodovy slice or a good slice, which means that if we intersect our NG with this A6, we get a surface, not only surface, but a surface with an isolated singularity. So let me show you an example with SR3C. You remember that SR3C has a two coefficients in the characteristic polynomial. And I write explicitly the, the matrices in SR3C. Let me call this in G. And these three, these two equations, this is let I called F1 and this is F2 equals zero. So NG we said defined by two equations. So it is a variety, but of the higher dimension. And we want to intersect this variety with the Slodovy slice to get a surface singularity. And how do we do this? As Slodovy described, we take a, a set of SL2 triple and we write down Slodovy slice which means this one, Slodovy slice should satisfy these conditions as matrices. And we, if we take the intersection of this NG, but, but with our Slodovy slice, we get this equation. And this equation, as you saw before at the beginning, this is an A2 singularity. I was saying that a chi minus one for the first singularity, this is for k equal three. This is this three is the a k minus one. So this is how we find the singularities, the correspondence between uh, varieties, uh, surfaces, and Lie algebras. So I take a Lie algebra, I take Slodovy slice, and the intersection is a surface. And here I wrote again with uh, the others that I was saying that there are some more uh, Lie algebras. These are what I called ADEs because this corresponds to isolated singularities. And these are our Lie algebras. If we take this Lie algebras and find the Slodovy slice, the intersection by NG of these things, we know that is a surface in C3 with isolated singularity, which means with only singularity at the origin. So this makes yeah, this helps us to construct surfaces with Lie algebras. As each classification of the objects in mathematics, this with this classification, we try to get some invariants or some properties of the singularity via Lie algebras. And here I didn't give the name, but this is exceptional Lie algebras. And the Briscoe theorem says that if you have a Lie algebra of ADE type, the intersection is a surface singularity and the restriction to S6 is this map. This is called a joint quotient map. The restriction of this map to S6 is, let me write, in this way is the default gives the deformation of the singularity. The singularities, uh, as I said uh, at the beginning of my talk, we try to remove the singularities, which means we try to make it uh, uh, so softer, I, I will say, because singularities, I said, we cannot define the tangent space. So 
And also we cannot understand the curves passing through the singularities which are on the surface. But when we do resolution, we try to, to, to zoom at the singular point. So we try to know what is going on at the singular points. So um, we do this uh, making zoom or the resolution process, which is uh, due to Hironaka, said that every singular point admit a resolution. We have also deformation to remove the singularity. So we have two process to improve a singularity. One is resolution of the singularity. The second one is deformation of the singularity. So this classification with Lie algebra helps us to deform the singularity using purely Lie algebra methods. So it is a, a nice classification. It helps to do some more things. And uh, in our example, I show how we find the Slodovy slice and we restrict our F to the Slodovy slice. And here, I will not go to the details, but this is C2 in the quotient map because of the definition of the Cartan subalgebra and whale group. And this will give a deformation here. Deformations means that we add one more parameter here. And with this parameter, our singularity has no singular, uh, uh, our variety has no singular point, the new variety with T parameter. And uh, until now, I said you what was in the literature. And now I will tell you what we did with Nakamoto is uh, we were looking for um, classifying uh, some interesting family of singularities via Lie algebra. Uh, and we found a Lie algebra, which is not really, uh, which didn't help us to understand our uh, singularity, but some other singularities. And this singular, this Lie algebra is SL2 plus SL2. It is a six dimensional Lie algebra. So I was saying that I am interested in finite dimensional Lie algebras. And we compute the nilpotent variety. You know that the nilpotent variety is the nilpotent variety of the first one and the nilpotent variety of the second one. This means that I have again two equations, but two more simple equations defining our ng. And this ng is four dimensional. So if I find another four dimensional hyperplane, and if I cut my ng with this hyperplane, I may find a surface. But what, is, what I should control is if my surface is isolated singularity or not. If it's smooth, we are not interested in. So for this, I will try to, to define a transversal slice. I say this is a transversal slice if the intersection is a surface, which means a variety with a singularity at the origin. And this is the only singularity. And we say that there exists a good slice. We can find a good slice, good hyperplane. We intersect with our nilpotent variety and it gives a simple elliptic singularity of D5 tilde type. What is this? These are different than ADE types. ADE types are more easy to understand uh, uh, in details, I will say, in the singularity point of view. And the next step is simple elliptic singularities. Sing simple elliptic singularities means, let me show you the equations. Singular elliptic singularities, again, we have f equals zero, a polynomial, and we, we are interested in v of f, 
which are surfaces again, but the surfaces in C3, they are, uh, we call them E6 tilde, E7 tilde, E8 tilde, and D5 tilde. And here you see that D5 tilde is different. We call these singularities hypersurface singularities. The variety is defined with one equation. And these are, this D5 tilde, it is a surface defined in C4 with two equations. So we call this complete intersections and we show with ICIS. Isolated complete intersection singularities. This is a big family in, the, in algebraic geometry. So it was interesting for us to find something for D5 tilde singularity. For this first three singularities, there are many works as they are hypersurface singularities. Uh, we know that Slodovi and Hermk and also, uh, I mean, Slodovi and Hermk, they try to find a Lie algebra corresponding to D5 tilde singularity, but their Lie algebra was infinite dimensional. What we find is a really simple Lie algebra and it is finite dimensional. This is the difference between two works. And here with this three, we know that Saito, and let me write the name, Saito, Loyenga, and many others, they did uh, works with uh, these three singularities. They try to describe the Lie algebras corresponding or algebras corresponding to these sets and the root systems corresponding to these uh, varieties, etc. But for the five tilde singularities, we didn't get much information. So now I say that if we take a G, which is SL2C, plus SL2C. If we take the nilpotent variety and there exists S, which means a good slice or a nice transversal slice, such that the intersection gives us D5 tilde singularity. Here, I give you an example of S. If we choose S in this way, it is two-dimensional hyperplane. And if we take the intersection, you know that NG is, uh, excuse me, where is NG is A square plus BC and D square plus EF, EF the equations. And we define this, we take the intersection of these two with our equations in NG. You see that these are quadratic equations, both, if you have two quadratic equations in C4, you know that it is related with D5 tilde singularity. And when we know how we know that it is exactly, you see the here, this is the Saito classifications. It is classified by Saito. And you, know, you see that this in this classification, we have two quadratic equations. And why we call simple elliptic? It is simple because uh, we understand a bit better than other singularities and elliptic singularities, because when we do resolution, I told you that we get an X tilde, we get a surface, which is, V of F, as F is one of this polynomial, we do a resolution here. And uh, in this X tilde, I told you that we have a curve configuration. But if we do resolution for these singularities, we get only one curve. And this curve has self-intersection, minus one, minus two, or minus three, minus four. Only one curve. And the genus of this curve is one. That's why it's called elliptic, the arithmetic genus of this curve. 
And as I told you that if we have two quadratic equations in C4, how do we know that we get D5 tilde or not? If you have two quadratic e equation, you know that we have two matrices, two, two symmetric four by four matrices. So these two form helps us to define a quadratic, two quadratic equations. And we say that this defines any two matrices for any two matrices. When you write this set, you know that it is a simple elliptic singularity of D5 tilde type. If and only if you take the characteristic polynomial of this matrix, the inverse of A multiplied by P, B, has no multiple root. So you just look at the characteristic polynomial to say that it is a D5 tilde singularity or not. This gives a characterization of quadratic equations defined in C4. And this is a characterization, but it is not a characterization as Slodovy did, because Slodovy uh, defined uh, the slices uh, using Lie algebra methods. That's why this proposition was nice to to find D5 tilde singularities from any two quadratic equation, but we are asked to find using Lie algebra methods, like in the case of ADEs. For this, we said we defined, we take SL2C, and from SL2C, we choose two different elements or the elements with some properties. We said as the elements of SL2C are semi-simple or nilpotent if we will call Xn, the two by two matrices, which are A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. and here minus A because the trace will be uh, zero. We will say uh, semi-simple elements and nilpotent elements, the elements in SL2C. And we will say a subspace of G, with our G here is always this G, SL2C plus SL2C. So I will take a subspace of G and I will call it good subspace if it has a basis XY such that X is written by a simple, semi-simple and nilpotent elements and here nilpotent elements and semi-simple elements because X is in G, which means that from the first one, I will take semi-simple element, the second one, nilpotent element, and for Y, vice versa. And we define the Slodovy slice, but generalized Slodovy slice by using this good subspaces. We say that a four-dimensional subspace in G is a good slice or is a generalized Slodovy slice if there exists a good subspace such that we get the elements with this condition. This condition is the killing form in G and the killing form is defined as I wrote here, which means that we will take the, we will multiply the matrices and we'll, we will take the sum of traces. So this gives us uh, this description using Lie algebra and the elements of the Lie algebra. That's why we call it generalized Slodovy slice. And of course, later on, we uh, wanted to know if we can, uh, first, let me tell you that uh, if we have these general elements, with the good subspace. And with this good subspace, we construct a slice and the intersection is always a D5 tilde singularity. This is what we proved. And here I say how we choose these elements, 
how what means general elements so the, since it is sl2 it was easy to to see the elements and to give an explicit description of this elements good ele good subspace so this is a technical things but i will tell you that here the intersection of our generalized Slodovic slice with our nilpotent variety give two quadratic equation, as you see. And with this quadratic equation, we know if this is the five tilde singularity or not from the proposition that I presented a few pages before. And later, we want to know if we can get the formation of the singularity as grotendic Briscoe theory. And here, our answer is yes, because uh, we take again the adjoint caution map and we define how we should deform our singularity by using our general elements. So the answer is yes, we can deform our singularities. And here I show how do we, sh we should deform. Of course, when we deform an intersection, we should deform ng, the nilpotent variety, which is in the intersection, and also the Slodovic slice. We should deform both things in a special way to get the deformation of the general uh, variety. And our theorem says that if we have a D5 tilde singularity, this is means D5 tilde singularity, how we found it as the NG intersect the Slodovic slice with general SXY. And if we take a base space, this means that we can deform it by seven parameters. And how we do it, we take some elements in the deformed Slodovic slice and we deform our adjoint caution map and we get deformation. I call pi because as I said, we improve the singularity. It can be resolution or deformation. So we say that the answer is good to that, which that we improve our singularity by deforming. And then the, the, the natural question is what happens if we have a finite number of SL2 plus SL2 plus SL2? In this case, we see that we can find always an intersection which, is, which gives a surface singularity, which is isolated, but we cannot get the formation of the singularity. So this doesn't help us to improve the singularity. That's why we thought it is uh, not really interesting to go further in this direction. But if some people, they try to classify these singularities, it can be nice. And also um, here, uh, this what I wrote is T1 is, as I said, this is the base space of the deformation. As you see, dimension is too big and it doesn't go well with the deformation, uh, semi-universal deformation of our singularities. And the, the next uh, wonder will be, instead of SL2 plus SL2, what happens if we take SLN C for some different ends? In this case, also we find some singularities, but the single, when we do resolution of the singularity, the genus of the singularity is too big. As you see here, it depends on N i's and it is too big for the moment. We were saying that the genus zero means AD singularities, genus one was simple elliptic singularities, and this genus is 
too big uh, to go further, at least for the moment. So we uh, say that um, by using Lie algebra, we find the, the, the singularities, but isolated singularities here. And uh, my actual work is to understand non-isolated singularities. And I am trying to see if we can relate isolated, non-isolated singularities of surfaces with Lie algebras using a similar work. And if we can deform non-isolated singularities in a nice way, the formation and resolution are, are my main interest uh, to understand singularities as most of the singularity theory uh, people. And thank you for participating. And again, thank you to organizers. Thank you, Meral, for your nice talk. Thanks. If you have some questions, please do not hesitate to ask directly. I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, hi, Meral. Thank you for the very good talk. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, so my first question is um, about this universal deformation spaces. Yes. So are all these singularities that you considered smoothable? Uh, yes. Is, yeah, they're all smoothable? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, my second question is, uh, what happens if you take uh, lower dimensional slices, then you get uh, harder, higher dimensional singularities? Yes. So can you get, I mean, oh, the talk was focused on surface singularities, but my question is, is there a picture, higher dimensional picture here? Because the Lie algebras are of high dimension. And if you take different slices, uh, you can take, you can get uh, three dimensional, yes. four dimensional singularities and so on. Yes, that is true. It is uh, in fact very interesting. Uh, I was thinking to get more students and more friends who are interested in this subject because uh, according to the dimension, of the slice, we may get uh, higher dimensional uh, varieties. And also according to the points of intersection. Yeah. Because I am always considering uh, the intersection at the origin. But when we get uh, different points with different uh, dimensional uh, good slices, we get very interesting singularities, but uh, I was trying to relate Lie algebras to rational singularities, in fact, mm -hmm. not simple elliptic singularities, because I was thinking that rational singularities of multiplicity two, they are related. So why not multiplicity three? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was my aim at the beginning. But then we found simple elliptic singularities, but uh, it's very interesting. Yes, yeah, I hope uh, we will do these things uh, perhaps with you one day. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, thank you. Thank very you. nice, thank you. Thank you for the question. Other questions or remarks? Some comments? If not, let's thank Meral Tusun again. Thank you very much. Thanks. And the next talk uh, starts at uh, 2 p.m. So we have a break till 2 p.m. Okay. Thanks, you Alex. Thank you. See you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. A chair of the afternoon session will be my colleague and friend, uh, Jordanka Paneva Konuska. So she will have the honor to give uh, the floor to all the speakers in the afternoon. Uh... Really, there is some change. Uh, I like to present Barbara because okay. I've, because I've known her for more than fifteen years. Uh, she is a member of very strong group in several complex variables in Ljubljana. This group is led by professors Josep Gubevnik and Frank Forsnerich. So it's a big pleasure for me to uh, give the floor to Professor Dernovšek to present 
her talk of proper holomorphic maps. Please, Barbara. Thank you very much. Uh, so it is my uh, great honor to be a speaker at this conference. So I hope that you will understand at least some part of my talk. I will try to be uh, not so, well, not to give too many details. And please ask uh, if you have any questions in between. So my talk will be on proper holomorphic, holomorphic maps which is um, a theme that I've been doing for uh, one of the themes that I do in my research. So um, let me first um, this explain the main problem. So I will denote by D open unit disk uh, in the complex plane. And I will mainly speak about holomorphic disks. So what is a holomorphic disk? This is a holomorphic map from the unit disk into some ambient space. So this X may be Euclidean space CN. So in this case, we have a map from the unit disk to CN, holomorphic map. This is simply F is a family of holomorphic functions and each of them maps from the unique disk into C. So a holomorphic disk is actually the holomorphic functions of one variable. So it's like a simple object. Okay, and we study more general objects. For example, we map these disks instead of into Euclidean space, we take a complex manifold as a target or even a complex plate with singularities. So um, we have heard a, a talk about singularities today. So this kind of space is not necessarily algebraic, it may be analytics, complex analytics space as a target, may, may be taken as a, as a target. Okay, so if the map F extends continuously up to the boundary, we call F a closed analytic disk. And the image of this point zero is called the center of the analytic disk. And in this talk, I will say something about the existence of analytic disks. Why are analytic disks interesting object? The main reason is that if we have a proper holomorphic disk, uh, then, so the word proper, it means that it is proper topologically so that the pre-image of any compact set uh, in X is a compact subset of the unit disk. So if we have this proper holomorphic disk, then the image is a complex subvariety of X. It may have singularities, but topologically is as, as simple as it gets. And in the case that when we can construct many of these um, disks, it is like an interesting property of the manifold or complex space X. Okay, so what are the most simple results? So the question is the following. We take X, for example, complex Euclidean space or a complex manifold, we take a given point in this X and we ask a question, whether there are any proper holomorphic disks which hit this point. So with the center at this point. So the most simple, the, the simplest case are convex domains. So for example, if we take a convex domain ECN, which is not equal to the whole of CN, we take any point. And then there is a complex line. So this is a complex affine one dimensional subspace of CN, such that the complex line through this point P intersects the complement of X in CN. And if the domain was convex, then we know that this intersection 
is a proper um, subset of the uh, complex line. So it is, it is simply connected because of con convexity. So it is biholomorphically equivalent to the unit disk. So not only that we have um, holomorphic disk, which hits this point, we have a, hom a holomorphic embedding through this point P, which is proper. So let me explain what proper means. I mean, I defined uh, the word proper by saying that the pre-images of the compact sets are compact. So what does it actually mean? It means that when we approach to the boundary of this, of this holomorphic disk here, we approach to the boundary of the domain. Okay, so in the convex domains, this is a very simple question, too simple to be asked. In more general domains, the proof requires some new methods. So the first positive result in this direction was uh, made by Forstner, Rich, and Globeunik um, in 1992. And they proved that through any given point in a strictly pseudo-convex domain in CN, there exists a proper holomorphic disk. So these strictly pseudo-convex domains these are the domains that you study within several complex variables. So function theory of holomorphic functions in CN is usually done on such domains. They've also provided an example, which was later um, made more even more um, interested by door, so of the domain, such that uh, there exists a point, such as through that point, there are no proper holomorphic disks. So Forstner and Globionic provided a domain with one such point and door provided a domain such that there are no proper holomorphic disks through any point of that domain. So this proves that we need to assume something from the domain and from the words that I've been using, convexity is somewhere used uh, for the existence. Okay. And then for more general targets, what have been known? So Globionic in 2000 proved that there are proper holomorphic maps through any point in a Stein manifold. So what is a Stein manifold? It can be um, realized as a complex submanifold of some Euclidean space of high enough dimension. Um, not all complex manifolds are Stein, for example, compact manifolds are not Stein. Uh, later, several years later, uh, Forstnerich and me, we further generalized this result to complex spaces with singularities. So this word n minus one convex, this says that we have some kind of exhaustion function, which made the makes it locally, in a way, a little bit convex. So the main addition here was that proper holomorphic disks also exist in complex spaces with singularities. And the most recent result is with my colleague Slapper. And we proved that for certain kind of domains in CN, uh, we can provide maps which have holomorphic disks which touch the domains from the at exactly one point, and they are proper holomorphic in CN. So these disks they escape 
to infinity. So here the addition is this local behavior here near the boundary of the domain. Okay, now I will try to explain something about the method of construction. So um, it is called Riemann Hilbert boundary value problem. There are many Riemann Hilbert problems around. So I will try to explain what is the general idea of this kind of problem. So first of all, we take a smooth family of Jordan domains EC2. So the parameter here, this small z, is a boundary of the unit disk. And at each boundary point, we have this Jordan domain. So how does this look like? Well, we have first Jordan domain for this point, and then we go, um, then we smoothly vary this um, family. And the only assumption here is that the z that zero is contained in the interior of all these Jordan, Jordan curves. So what is the problem? The problem is finding a holomorphic analytic disk F such that its boundary belongs to this family gamma. So at each boundary point, the boundary is somewhere on the boundary on this Jordan curve. So the exact solution of this nonlinear Riemann Hilbert problem is a difficult problem and it has been used in the study of polynomial Hulls. Here we only need approximate solution to this problem. And the approximate solution is much simpler. So approximate solution is enough to construct proper holomorphic disks. And it has been used in some other um, parts of, let's say, several complex variables. This is Poletsky theory, and also lately in minimal surface theory. So let me explain the simplest possible version of the problem. So we are given a closed analytic disk, which is just the linear disk um, in the first variable. And then for each, then, then we define a whole, a smooth map G, which is defined on the product of the unit circle times the unit disk. It maps into C2. And at each fix, at each point of this uh, circle, we just take the vertical disk. So here at this point, I take a vertical disk. I cannot draw into them in four dimensions. That's why all my disks are just lines. And so for each boundary point, I get here, I get a vertical line. Okay, so what is uh, this model case of a Riemann Hilbert problem? We are looking for a closed analytic disk H. So we are looking for a continuous map from the closed disk, from the closed unit disk into C2, such that the boundary um, for each boundary point Z, the, the boundary point H of Z lies near the boundary of the vertical disk. So in my picture, the boundary should lie somewhere here near the boundary. Then the disk H is supposed to be close to the, to the um, horizontal disk F on a given compact subset of the unit disk. And outside of this compact subset, H is supposed not to be too far from the given family. And it has to have the same center. So what is the solution? 
we are seeking for a map which looks like like this. And here we can guess exact solution. So exact solution in this case is just the map H of Z equals Z, Z to the power N for N large enough. So again, what is um, what are the, the relevant properties of this map? Well, the zero is mapped to zero in C2. The map is, the second component is as small as we want on a compact subset of the unit disks for N large enough, which means that we get very good approximation on a compact subset. So when, um, Z equals uh, modulus one, we are close here to the boundary. Okay, this was too simple. And the general the case looks a bit more difficult to formulate, but actually it exactly says, says the same thing. So what we start with the closed holomorphic disk F, and we take G to be a continuous map such that for each Z on the unit circle, the map which maps W to the G of ZW is a closed analytic disk with the center F of Z. So what is the picture? I start by a holomorphic disk F, then through each boundary point, F of Z, I attach a holomorphic disk. So if this is F of Z, then this is a holomorphic disk parameterized by W, G of Z, W. So I go all around the boundary of F, I attach this continuously varying family of maps. And then the solution of the Riemann-Hilbert problem is the following. Given positive epsilon and R between zero and one, there exists a closed analytic disk H, which has the same center as F, such that its boundary, so for each, point of the unit circle, the distance between H of Z and the boundary of the corresponding holomorphic disk G is as close as we like. Then we have approximation on a complex subset. Uh, sorry, here is the approximation on a complex subset. And in between, between the complex subset and the boundary, we don't get too far away from the origin from this continuously varying family of maps. So what is the solution here on the picture? Well, we have to go through the same center. The boundary should be somewhere here near the boundary of the continuously varying family. And here we have approximation on a compact subset. So here the picture is not so simple anymore, but the exact finding this um, um, approximate solution is not very difficult. Actually, it is a good use of a Cauchy formula. So I will just give an idea behind the solution. So this is my family of holomorphically varying disks. This is the starting disk. And this here, I defined lambda as the subtract these two maps. So this map lambda is continuous uh, on the unit circle times the unit disk. And by taking Cauchy formula, we can approximate lambda uniformly by Laurent time polyno Laurent polynomials of the following form. So 
these coefficients aj are polynomial in the uh, in in this z and if we plug in instead of w z to the high power of k so here instead of w i plug in z to the k what happens here i get z to the k to the j and then this cancels out the pole and then this function this new function uh, satisfies all the um, properties in my theorem so this is again defined this is a holomorphic disk it goes through the same uh, center it approximates if we took this k large enough as well as we like and its boundary is by construction close to the boundary of the given family okay so how are these proper holomorphic disks constructed? Well, the idea of the construction is the following. So we take X to be uh, an increasing union of the sets XJ, and then we construct these maps uh, inductively. So how do we do that? Well, at each inductive step, we construct a closed analytic disk Fj, which have the following properties. The boundary of this analytic disk lies outside the set Xj. F, so the next disk approximates the previous one on a compact subset of the unit disk. And these two disks have the same centers. So let me draw a picture. So if we have this xj, and here we have xj plus one. So we start by analytic disk fj, such that its boundary is outside of xj. And this so to get, the, I will try to come from this fj to fj plus one. So what are the properties of the next one? Well, it has the same center. It approximates the previous one on the compact subset. So it should look like this. But then its boundary should be outside of xj plus one. So it looks like this. And then once we can construct this kind of sequence of holomorphic disks, then this approximation on compact subsets give us uniform approximation so that the limit exists. And then the limit map, we can make it proper as uh, this is the property that we would like to have. And of course, since all the disks had the same center, it also touches the same center. So this is roughly the idea of how to do this, uh, how to produce this sequence of maps. So the question is, how do we proceed from Fj to Fj plus one? And at that step, we use the solution to the Riemann-Hilbert problem. So, as when I was drawing, I was drawing convex domains. So, if X is a convex domain, then X can be written as a union of strictly convex domains at J. And then this continuously varying family of analytic disks for the Riemann-Hilbert problem can be constructed just by taking a parametrized family of linear disks, which are tangent to the boundary. So the solution of the Riemann-Hilbert problem gives the inductive step. So 
here if I have two convex domains, xj and xj plus one. And then I have this holomorphic disk. Here is its boundary. And I would like to go with the disk. I, I, I need a holom uh, this continuously varying family of analytic disks. How do I get it? Well, at each point, I just take a linear disk such that its boundary is at outside of xj plus one. Uh, and I can do that continuously all along the boundary of the disk fj. So in the convex case, the solution is easy, but in the convex case, we knew it from the start. So for more general domains, we need some convexity property of the boundary. So we need to imitate this idea, but we cannot do it globally. So even more complicated, if we, instead of taking convex domains, we take X to be a complex manifold, then we have to assume that X has an exhaustion function with certain convexity properties. So what is an exhaustion function? Well, an exhaustion function, let's say rho, is a function which maps from the manifold to R, to real numbers. And uh, it is proper, so they, um, so it's uh, level sets, sub-level sets are compact. And then, we go from one level set to another sub-level set the same way as we did for uh, convex domains. But if we are on a manifold, then we cannot solve the Riemann-Hilbert problem globally. We don't have convexity globally and we cannot add the um, we cannot add two holomorphic disks if we map to a manifold. So there are two more problems that we need to address. The first problem is, as I said, the Riemann-Hilbert problem works only in Euclidean space. So we can use solution to the Riemann-Hilbert problem locally in the local coordinates, but then we have to make this solution global and in order, in the, the way that we do it, we globalize this local correction using holomorphic sprays. And another problem with this exhaustion function is that they have critical points and the critical level sets, these are the level sets where the topology changes, uh, we have to deal with them separately. But it turns out that this is not such a big problem. Okay, so I will try to explain holomorphic sprays because this is the main new idea here. And um, they provided many uh, new and important applications in several complex variables. So instead of taking one map, I will first draw a picture and, and then I will explain the definition. So instead of taking one disk or one map, it turns out that it is easier to work with the family of maps. So in, if we are in CN, we just take the family of translates. So instead of taking a holomorphic disk F, of Z, uh, we take all the translates. So we take, let's say G of Z T is F of Z plus T, where F was a map from the unit disk into CN. And so here we can take T to be any point in CN. So this is the most, the easiest way we just translate. The general case is the following. 
okay, we take D to be some more general subset of C. Here, I usually take the unit disk and subsets of unit disk with smooth boundary. So this spray of maps is a map, which is a map from, a, from the product P times closure of D to X, where P is the parameter set, is an open subset of the some Euclidean space CM. And the map F is holomorphic on the domain and continues up to the boundary. So I need to have maps through the given point. That's why I assume that all this, all this for all the parameters T, the maps agree at zero. So in my picture, actually I cannot take the translates. I, I can take maps like this so that they all go through the same center. And the most important is the domination property. It says that the differential with respect to the parameter at any point TZ is surjective. So of course it, it cannot be true for the fixed point, but for all the other points. And here the name spray uh, comes along. So we spray the neighborhood. So here for each point, that is um, in the image, we spray the neighborhood. We can cover the neighborhood by the uh, maps which are close. So why, why these holomorphic sprays work? First of all, we need, to see, we, we need to see that they exist. So, okay, let me say a word about them. So holomorphic sprays were introduced by Gramov and they were very much used in oka grauer theory. Here we adapt a bit simpler version that was that is the version, the version from the oka grauer theory. So first of all, we have to see that the sprays exist. So if we take any relatively compact domain with smooth boundary in C and a close, a continuous map from this domain to X, which is holomorphic in the interior, then we can embed this map into a spray. So there exists a spray from some parameter set P times closure of D to X, such that F0 is the um, part of this spray. Okay, now sprays exist and now we can make new sprays from old ones. So for this, we need to know where we can uh, do that. Well, we can do that on um, some sets which are called, called Cartan pairs. Cartan pair is a, are sets D0, D1, which are of the following nature. So, all the sets, D0, D1, their union and their intersection are smooth, uh, uh, have smooth boundaries and uh, the sets are well separated. So D0 without the D1 closure intersected by the closure of the D1 without D0 is empty. So for example, what could be uh, an example of such a Cartan pair, we take, a smoothly bounded subset of C, which is called D0. And then we just go along the boundary of D0. Let me we move forward smoothly. We can hear. We can do something like that. So this red is D1. And all the sets, if, if I made these uh, things correctly here, uh, when, when I went uh, 
along. So all these um, properties could be met. And then I can glue. So I will just try to explain this um, lemma on gluing sprays by drawing first. So here is the set D0 and here is the set D1. And above D0, I have one spray. So I have a family, a parametrized family of holomorphic maps. And along uh, above D1, I have another spray, which approximates initial spray very good on the intersection. So it looks like this. And then if I have this kind of picture, then on a smaller parameter set, I can glue those sprays. So there exists a new spray, which is defined on D0 union D1. And it takes, it approximates the first one on D0 and it takes the values from D1, uh, from the red one. So it looks like this. And this picture explains how we can uh, put the, the solution of the Riemann Hilbert problem into the picture. So here I have this original map. In the um, local coordinates, I can make good changes of the boundary. And then I glue these sprays together. And it happens that this is what one needs. Okay, so the constructions in general go the, the following way. We build the manifold X by attaching convex bumps. So X is union of XJ, where XJ without XJ minus one is just a convex bump. In some local coordinates, this means like here is XJ, and then XJ plus one is this one, xj plus two could be this one. And then the whole manifold is built by attaching these convex bumps. Well, I lied a little bit. I can get only if I don't have any critical points of the exhaustion function, then I can build the manifold like this. So here, no changes of topology happen. Okay. So at each inductive step, I just push um, the boundary of an analytic disk outside the newly attached bump. And I do this in many, many steps with sprays and this construction works. Okay. So I went perhaps too much into the proof, but I will try to explain that these methods also work in some other areas of mathematics. In the recent years, they were applied to the minimal surface theory. So uh, our complex analytic group from Ljubljana got in contact with a group of um, minimal surface theory in Granada in Spain. And uh, together, well, these guys, which are, their names are here, Antonio Alarcón, um, Franz Forstnerich and Francisco Lopez. In the last 10 years, they applied many complex analytic methods in minimal surface theory. Well, I did something, some results also with them. Um, so they, well, they used this uh, Riemann Hilbert method, which allows very intricate um, control on the 
where these disks or where some maps map and uh, some other complex analytic tools like holomorphic disks, uh, holomorphic sprays that I already explained and also some others. So let me just uh, say a few words about that. So for example, the theorems of the following type have been obtained. Uh, we take a domain D in Rn, which is bounded strictly convex domain with C to smooth boundary. And then we take a compact border Riemann surface and a map F from M to D, which is a conformal minimal immersion of class C1. And we can approximate F uniformly on compacts in the interior of M by continuous maps G, such that G on the interior of M is a complete proper conformal minimal immersion. So why one considers such maps? Well, the image is a minimal surface is in Rn. And the long-standing question was whether one can construct complete bounded minimal surfaces in R3. And uh, Alarcon and Forstrich, they proved that such uh, surfaces exist. And here we added some approximation results and some smoothness results. So a similar result, well, the similar methods were used for the following result. Um, it was obtained by Alarcon, Forsnerich, and Lopez. Again, we take a compact border treatment surface uh, with non-empty boundary. And then every smooth Legendrian curve, here Legendrian curve is a complex Legendrian curve for the usual uh, complex quantum structure on C to N plus one. Uh, holomorphic in the interior can be approximated uniformly on M by continuous injective max, maps G whose restriction to the interior is a complete holomorphic Legendrian embedding. Um, this year, they published a monograph uh, entitled Minimal Surfaces from a Complex Analytic Viewpoint. And it is intended for students, for um, researchers in the nearby fields, and um, I think it is very well written, and it gives a nice introduction to the to these methods. Um, okay, let me just say a few more words. So, I, at the beginning, I explained that we can furthermore. Um, obtain the result that this holomorphic this also touch the given sets. So for a sets which make sense in complex analysis, these are, for example, um, bounded domains with smooth boundary of finite one type. At a given point P, where we have some more technical assumptions, then there exists a proper holomorphic map from the unit disk into CN, which goes through the given boundary point of this domain. And it, the, this holomorphic disk touches the domain exactly at the given point. So the picture is as follows. We have the domain, we have the point, if the domain was convex, then it's very simple, but usually here the assumption is not convexity, it's something much less, but still we can get a holomorphic disk, which is proper, and it only touches the closure of the domain at the given point. And um, 
I think I would like to stop here. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker for the interesting talk. Any questions or remarks? Any questions, please, or remarks? Okay, if not, then uh, let's thank again the speaker. And the next talk starts at uh, three o'clock in 10 minutes. Uh, the next speaker is Mirjana Bukovic from Academy of uh, Sciences and Art of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The title of uh, her talk is uh, from uh, Krasner's uh, Corduit uh, and uh, Bourbaki uh, Krasner's Graded Rings to Krasner, uh, Krasner Bukovic uh, per, uh, Paragraded Rings. Please, Professor. Bukovic. Thank you very much. I want to thank thank for the invitation to participate in the conference, scientific conference Women in Mathematics uh, in South and Eastern Europe 2021. One to institute Institute po Mathematica Informatica Bulgarska Academia Nanautite. Uh, I'm Mirjana Vukovic from uh, um, Professor Emeritus uh, of University of Sarajevo and academician, full member of Academy of Sciences and Arts of Bosnia and Herzegovina. My talk will be from Krasner's Corporate and Burbaki Krasner's Graded Rings to Krasner Vukovic Paragraded Rings and their Radicals. <laughs> The paper supplemented with the short historical development of graded structures, in particular paragraded rings, which begins with the series of uh, krasner vukovic uh, proceedings of Japan Academy Notes uh, and the uh, Queen's Papers monograph, first appeared late in 80, uh, 1980s. We will present Prime, Bear, and Jacobson Radical discuss uh, the general Kurosha Mitsur theory uh, of uh, radicals uh, of paragraded rings, establish that uh, Artin Divinsky Sulinsky theorem holds, uh, and then give characterization of normal and special Andrunakievich rebuking radicals of paragraded rings, and finally provide information about ongoing work. Regarding, uh, regarding brown McCoy radicals dedicated to, the, to Alexander Vasilievich Mikhailov on his uh, 80th birthday of paragraded rings. The notion of graduation is, at least in the light of certain examples, quite an old one. Uh, it was introduced explicitly into mathematics during 18th century when Euler defined the notion of polynomials and real homogeneous functions. This notion when applied to the case of single variable was already familiar to mathematicians well before Euler. Diophant, some Arab mathematician, get uh, Descartes. Uh, the germ of the notion of homogeneity can be seen in early Greek mathematics and in same, some documents of Babylonian time. Mark Rasner, uh, old, which is uh, new, Le Vieux Kienef. Uh, however, the first relatively general definition of graded groups was given by Bourbaki, but this definition was not general enough because it was formulated with uh, some unnecessarily restrictive conditions. I Bubaki's definition was based on the notion of the abelian group. Mark, <clears throat> Mark Krasner started his study on Anogradier General, giving up the original 
unnecessary restructions uh, and first introduced the theory of general graded structures, groups, rings, modules, assuming for the set of grades only its uh, non emptiness. Since in his definition, additive gradation and structures of rings and modules will imply operations generally partial in the set of grades. However, Krasner's earliest works along this line deal with graded fields, with graded fields, Excuse me. Fields when studying well valued fields and observing connection between the evaluation ring by using the equivalence of valuation led him to the abstract notion of corporate. Corporate actually is actually a homogeneous part of graded field graded by an arbitrary set with induced operations among which the induced addition is naturally a partial. A partial. So starting from the corporate Krasner uh, discovered general graded theory uh, in uh, 1944 and 1945, as well as the theory of homogroupoids, anates, and moduloids, where corporate uh, as a special case of an anate is uh, viewed as a homogeneous part of a graded field. Graded fields are not to be understood as fields with graduation, but fields are to be understood as graded fields with trivial graduation. Those, as it is usually to say that the modern ring theory begin with, uh, began with the celebrated other Bern's classification theorem in 98, uh, it can also freely to say that abstract notion of corporate introduced during 1940s uh, in a series of Mark Rasner's Contrandi notes uh, is the germ, germ of notions of homogeneity and its corresponding grade, grades uh, as well as to Burbaki graded and Krasner and Krasner the general graded rings, the leading further to the Krasner Vukovic paragraded rings. It is known that the homogeneous part of the direct product of uh, graded groups, rings, and modules does not have to be direct sum and direct product of the homogeneous parts of those graded structure, respectively. It served Mark Rasner and myself as a motivation to introduce paragraded structures, groups, rings, and modules, groups, rings, and modules uh, in our papers uh, uh, from uh, published in Academy of Sciences of Japan, Academy of Sciences, and Finns papers in Pure and Applied Mathematics, edited by Paolo Ribbenboim. Dreaming new paths in the theory of graded structures has helped Mark Rasner and myself to overcome seem in very difficult obstacles leading uh, us to solve this problem, this problem. And so we discover fascinating new theory, the most graded general structures, group, ring, groups, rings, modules called paragraded that are closed with respect to the direct sum and the direct product. Uh, this uh, investigation has brought me to explore an enchanted realm of paragraded rings uh, promoted after the initial uh, approach in uh, my papers uh, with my uh, pupils uh, to develop in paper 6, 7, 25, the theory of different uh, types of radicals. And further, it is important to point out the construction of certain examples of paragraded rings, which are not graded in 6, 24, 25. Continuing our study in its 
initiated uh, in a forementioned paper in which different radicals began, beginning from Bears and uh, Jacobson's radicals through uh, general Kuro Shamitsur theory to normal and special Nunakievich Ryabuhin radicals of paragraded rings were introduced and investigated. We came to the paragraded Brown McCoy radicals. Let us now first recall the notion of krasner lukovich paragraded rings, following uh, uh, as well as two examples of paragraded rings which are not graded to illustrate some interesting ring theoretic results. Definition uh, ring uh, R is called the paragraded ring if there exists a mapping pi from delta to Hg of r plus, uh, pi of delta equal r delta, delta from delta of a partial order z, delta less, which is from below complete semilatis and from above in inductively ordered to the set Hg of r plus uh, of subgroups r delta of additive group r plus uh, called paragraduation if the following axioms are satisfied. R1 pi of zero equal R0 zero equal zero, where zero is uh, inf of delta, delta less uh, than delta prime implies R delta contained or equal R delta prime. Uh, A equal remark, A equal union of R delta is called homogeneous part of R with respect to pi and elements of R, A are called homogeneous element uh, elements. If X remark to, uh, if uh, X from A, we say that X delta of X is equal inf of delta from delta, such that X uh, from uh, uh, R delta is the grade of, or degree, principal grades of, uh, and they form the set of uh, set which is denoted by delta pi. Uh, delta P. R2, theta contained or equal uh, delta, implies uh, uh, intersection of R delta equal, equal R inf of theta. R3, homogeneous part uh, A, uh, is a uh, generating set, uh, is a generating set of R plus, uh, plus uh, with the set of A in a relation X plus plus y equals z. Let b is contained or equal a be a subset such that for all x and y from, from b, there exists an upper bound for delta x and delta y. Then there exists uh, an upper bound for all delta of x, x from b. For uh, all c and eta from delta, there exists zeta from delta such that r c uh, r delta is contained or equal r zeta. From this definition, we obtain binary observation on delta, xi eta to xi times eta is equal sub of uh, delta of x such that x from r xi times r eta called the minimal multiplication and so r xi r eta is contained or equal r uh, product of xi and eta. As usual, we denote uh, delta star equal delta without zero. The definition of paragraded ring can be expressed uh, using the definition of paragraded group uh, as follows. Uh, a ring R is called paragraded ring if it's uh, additive group R plus is paragraded group and if for all C and data from delta, there exists data from delta such that uh, we have R5. Uh, to make the paper more readable, we will include an expanded, expanded preliminary section and give some necessary notions from the theory of paragraded rings and modules, which we will need later. Uh, everything stated in this section can be found in more detail in our first papers and my published in Grenoble. So we will use uh, uh, here the notion of uh, an homogeneous ideal of, of a quasi-anid, of a paragraded mo module, and of a quasi-module, which we uh, recall in the sequel. 
definition uh, and uh, ideal i of a paragraded ring is called homogeneous if i is generated by intersection i a, um, i and uh, a by a in our relations where a is the homogeneous part of our structure a plus product which satisfies axioms r one bis r five is uh, called uh, quasi anaid if r is paragraded ring with the uh, homogeneous part a then we may observe restructions of operations from r to a induced uh, addition is uh, partial and we write X addible Y is equivalent with X plus Y from A for each X and Y from A. And we say that X and Y are addible. The obtained structure is called the para anade. If X from A, let A of X set of Y from A such that X of uh, addible Y quasi anade does not have to be a para anade, but it is under a few more assumptions, uh, in which case A can be uh, linear reside to a paragraded ring denoted by A bar whose homogeneous part it is. Uh, proposition. Para anid A, A satisfies the following axioms. I will not uh, give these axioms. Uh, uh, they are expressed uh, using uh, addibility. Uh, definition one, six structure A plus product, which satisfies axioms I uh, one bis I five is called uh, quasi anid. What is uh, uh, linearization of a paragraded ring? Uh, let A be a para anid, I uh, homogeneous part of some ring R. If A is also a homogeneous part of some other ring R prime, the rings R and R prime are A isomorphic, i.e. A ring with the homogeneous part A is determined up to an A isomorphism. And when it occurs, uh, will be denoted by a bar and uh, called uh, linearization of the paranoid A. Uh, example of paragraded rings in uh, Krasner and myself uh, uh, in uh, 60. Krasner and uh, myself uh, show that there are paragraded rings which are graded. Here, by graded ring R, we, may, uh, we mean that R is equal uh, direct sum of R delta and that for oxy and data from delta. There it is data from delta such that the product of R, C, and R eta is contained or equal R zeta there, where there are delta R additive subgroups of R and delta is non-empty set, only non-empty set. However, there are numerous examples of paragraded rings uh, which are not graded. We provided such class of paragraded rings, uh, and so we obtained the results. Result, uh, paragraded ring which is not graded exists. Where are listed? Uh, here are listed two such examples. Let A be ring and observe the ring of upper triangular matrix. Matrices are equal A, A, zero, A. Also let R delta one, this R delta two, this R delta three, this and R delta four also. If R0 zero, zero matrix uh, uh, denote by delta, the set uh, uh, union of zero and uh, delta I, I from go from one bis uh, four. For convenience, let delta zero equal zero. Set delta is partially ordered set, which is from below complete semilatis and from uh, above inductively ordered set with respect to uh, uh, delta I less delta J is equivalent with the R delta I. 
uh, is contained or equal are delta j i and j goes from one uh, this uh, four. It is easy to see that r is paragraded in with respect to pi. Uh, delta e go to r delta i, delta i from delta. Uh, know that r is not graded with respect to pi since for instance, a intersection of r delta one and r delta four is not r zero. Now we have uh, one example, uh, we can uh, prove it is interesting to notice that every element delta from delta is either an idempotent or nilpotent of degree of nilpotency two with respect to the minimal multiplication. The following table shows this property. Shows this property, we now have uh, uh, one uh, example more. Let us observe a subring AA00 of the paragraded ring from the previous example. It is also paragraded ring with respect to paragraded, uh, paragrading or paragraduations pi delta one delta two go to sg of r plus uh, which is given by these relations it is also worth to note notice that this paragrading induces the minimal multiplication which makes the paragrading set a conservative uh, partial group weight it is known that uh, any radical of a ring can be defined in terms uh, of the uh, appropri uh, appropriate class of modules over the ring. Uh, Andronakiewicz and Ryabuchin. This is also valid for graded rings uh, as well as uh, the most general graded rings called paragraded rings uh, introduced by Krasner, Mike, Mark Krasner. Krasner and myself, I, any paragraded radicals of paragraded rings can be described in terms of some class of paragraded modules over that ring. Now, if R is a paragraded ring with paragraduation P, pi, uh, from delta, delta, little delta from big delta, go to R delta, delta from delta, and the M uh, ring, uh, right R module, then M is called paragraded R mo module. If uh, M plus is paragraded additive group for pi prime instead of pi, D big instead of delta, M instead of R, and an equal union MD uh, instead of A. And if moreover, for all D from D and delta from delta, there exists T uh, element from D such that uh, pi prime of D times R delta is contained or equal pi prime of T. If we observe restructions of addition from M to N, and if external multiplication M times R go to M to N times A go to N, we obtain a structure called a paramoduloid. A paramoduloid N of a paranoid A certainly satis satisfies the following axioms. You can see I cannot time to read all. A quasi-moduloid quasi N of a, a quasi anade A is a structure which satisfies axioms M1 with M4. It does not have to be paramoduloid. It will be a paramoduloid under a few more assumptions in uh, which case n can be uh, linearized to a paragraded module, which we denote uh, by n bar, n bar, whose uh, homogeneous parts it is. It is worth nothing to, uh, that abstract radical theory has its origin in the theory of rings going back to 
the 1940, as well as that in the theory of rings, many structural results were obtained with the use of radicals. In generalizing uh, uh, the classical notion of the radical in a ring, uh, different kinds of radicals have been defined by a number of authors, including uh, Amitsura, Zumaya, Baer, Brown, McCoy, uh, Jacobson, Ketelwitzki, McCoy, but a significant contribution was made by the entry constellation, constellation of Russian and USSR are uh, mathematicians as Kurosh, Maltsev, Andrunakievich, Ryabuhin, Shirshov, Skorniakov, Kastrikin, Mikhailov, and their, their numerous uh, pupils. Let's say now, Kelarev, Let's say now briefly something about prime bear and or bear and Jacobson radical of paragated rings uh, we have uh, studied earlier. The prime spectrum of paragraded ring is induced in six. We, here we re reformulate uh, it for quasi anates. Let A be quasi anate definition appropriate. Uh, uh, ideal P of A is said to be prime if for all ideals I and J, uh, the uh, A the uh, of A uh, product I uh, times J is contained or equal P implies I or J contained or equal P. As in the case of rings, uh, one may prove that the ILP of the A is prime if and only if X A J is uh, Y is contained or equal P implies X or Y from P. The set of all prime ideals is de denoted by spec of A. The prime or the bare radical of a quasi A is defined, did, is defined to be the set uh, intersection of all P such that P is from spectrum of A and is denoted by beta of A. Proposition. Let A be a para anide, that is, let A be uh, linearizable to a paragraded ring A bar. If we now have A, B, and C, A, if P uh, bar is uh, element of spectrum of A bar, then intersection of P bar and A is from spectrum uh, where spec of A bar is spectrum of uh, uh, a bar uh, regarded uh, uh, as a ring, uh, regarded as a ring. If Q is, spect is from spectrum A, then there exists a P bar from spectrum A, such that uh, Q is intersection of P bar and A. Prime radical of, uh, of A coincides with beta, intersection of beta of A bar and A, where the beta of I bar denotes the prime radical of uh, a bar regarded as a ring. Uh, the radicals of graded rings have been, and now we will say something about Jacobson radical, uh, the radical of graded rings have been investigated by a number of authors. Many structural results were in, uh, obtained with the use of radicals of so Jacobson radical seems to be the most efficient. The paragraded Jacobson radical, similar to Jacobson radical in the graded classical case, have an important role to play and serve as a building block in the description of a paragraded rings, which is uh, demonstrated for the category of paragraded rings with the same set of grades in five. Inspired by Albert Stadt results from his PT, PG thesis, uh, we first introduced uh, and studied uh, two various uh, uh, versions of paragraded Jacobson and uh, large Jacobson radicals of paragraded rings. Further motivated by the, but I have not time for uh, a uh, Brown McCoy radicals and I will need to set now. The heart of uh, an 
uh, A quasi modulo id M denoted by C is defined to be the set of X from M such that for each Y from M X addible Y and uh, uh, A quasi modulo id M is called regular if for every A and B from A and X from M, X A and X B not, is not from uh, C, where C is the heart of M and uh, X A adible X ba, uh, B implies uh, A adible B. The Jacobson radical of uh, uh, quasi and or para anade A is defined to be the intersection of annihilators of uh, all irreducible uh, regular A quasi moduloids, uh, uh, paramoduloids, the intersection of annihilators of uh, all irreducible, irreducible A quasi moduloids, uh, paramoduloids is called the large Jacobson radical of a quasi anade of uh, para anade A. It can be easily proved that the Jacobson radical of regular uh, quasi anade A without heart coincides with the intersection of full maximum modular right ideals of A and uh, right ideal I of a quasi anade A is called modular if there exists an element U from A such that uh, uh, a congruent UI modulo EI for uh, the all elements uh, A from big A. Let A be a para anade A bar, it's a linearization. If uh, JL of A is the large Jacobson radical of A and J, J of A bar, the ordinary Jacobson radical of the ring. A bar, then J L of A is equal J uh, A bar intersected with A. Lemma, now we have one lemma, let A be a regular paranoid without heart, such that for each element delta of the corresponding paragrading set delta star, we have A the delta on to z equal zero or delta with respect to the minimal to the minimal multiplication the degree of all unities modulo a, a proper modular right ideal v have a common idempotent upper bound jacobson radical let I be proper modul modular right ideal for regular paranoid without heart, such that for each element delta of the corresponding paragrading set to delta star, we have a delta on two or delta delta with respect to the minimal multiplication, the least common. Uh, upper bound of all unities modulo E i is called uh, the degree of E. Let A be a regular para anade without heart, such that for each element delta of the corresponding paragrading set delta star, we have A the delta on two equals zero, zero or delta with respect to minimal multiplication and uh, let C be an idempotent element of delta star. Also assume that delta star is conservative partial groupoid with respect to minimal multiplication, then there exists a one to one correspondence between the uh, maximal modular right ideals of A of degree C and the maximal modular right ideals of the ring A of uh, C. An element A of uh, paranade A is called the right, left, quasi regular if A is not a left, right, uh, unity modulo any proper right ideal of A. A right uh, ideal of A is called uh, quasi regular if ev every of its elements is right, quasi regular. Now we have one uh, theorem. 
for Jacobson uh, radical, but uh, I will not give this theorem. This is uh, more important. Let A be a regular paranoid without half, such that for each element delta of the corresponding uh, paragrading set delta star, we have uh, A del delta on two is equal zero or is equal delta with respect to the minimal multiplication and let C be an idempotent element of delta star. Also assume that delta star is a conservative partial groupoid with respect to the minimal multiplication. Then we have J of A of C is equal intersection of J of A and J and A of C. Uh, it should be emphasized that the essential role of uh, developing theory of radicals had Kuros and Amitsur, with uh, who between 20, uh, 1952 uh, and uh, 1954 independently introduced the general uh, theory of radicals in various algebraic structures, and Andrunakiewicz and Yabuchin, who introduced the special theory of radicals. In addition, they have shown that uh, every Kurosh Amitsu radical for associative things he described in the uh, language of modules in much the same way as the Jacobson radical. Although the genesis of abstract radical theory begins with rings and other algebraic structures, groups, rings, modules, mentioned only in the fundamental papers Kurosh and Amitsur in the 1950s, an examination of the mathematical literature of the USSR uh, uh, reveals uh, that uh, group theory exerted a major influence on the development of uh, abstract radical concept. Uh, K, the category of paragraded rings with the quasi-homogeneous homomorphisms, let uh, gamma be a class of rings from such that uh, gamma A, gamma is closed with respect to uh, quasi-homogeneous homomorphism if A from gamma and B is a uh, homomorphic image of A under quasi-homogeneous homomorphism, then B is from gamma, B for every paragraded ring, A, the sum uh, sigma of A is equal sigma of uh, I, normal subgroups of A, such that uh, I is from gamma of homogeneous ideals is in gamma, and C gamma of A of uh, gamma of A equals zero for every paragraded ring A. Definition class gamma of paragraded rings from K, which satisfies A, B, C, and C is called paragraded radical class or a radical class of paragraded rings in the sense of Kurosh and Amitsu, briefly paragraded radical. Uh, gamma of A is called paragraded gamma radical of A. Uh, paragraded ring A is called paragraded gamma radical ring if A from gamma, uh, uh, i.e. gamma of A is equal A. Now we have one theorem, but I have no the time. We have one lemma. Lemma, uh, which I need uh, for for uh, a proof of uh, Artin Divinsky Sulinsky theorem for any paragraded radical gamma and any A from K. If I is a homogeneous ideal of A, then gamma of I is a normal subgroup of A. Now we, I want to uh, tell something about special radicals. Uh, let A be an associative paragraded ring with the paragrading set delta by sigma denote a class of paragraded A modules by a paragraded annihilators um, and of M uh, of a paragraded A mo module M 
we mean a homogeneous ideal way generated by the set uh, union of uh, each x from a delta such that uh, m uh, times x is equal to zero. We de define the kernel of the class uh, sigma a to be uh, intersection of all annihilators of uh, m. If uh, sigma is uh, uh, empty, then we define care of sigma a equal a. The class sigma of all sigma a is called a general class of paragraded modules if the following axioms are satisfied. If m from sigma a over b, then m from sigma a. If uh, m from sigma a and b from uh, is contained or equal annihilator of uh, m, then m from sigma a over b. If care of sigma a equals zero, then sigma b is not uh, uh, empty for any non-zero homogeneous ideal b of a. If uh, sigma b is not uh, empty for any non-zero homogeneous ideal of b of a, then care of sigma of a is uh, zero. Uh, the sigma paragraded radicals, sigma of uh, sigma and a of paragraded ring a is defined to be the set uh, sigma of uh, uh, the set uh, sigma uh, gamma of sigma and the a equal care of sigma a, where sigma is union, uh, union of all sigma a is a general class of paragraded modules. Uh, theorem let be. Let sigma be a general class of paragraded mod modules, then the sigma paragraded radical of uh, is a radical in the category of paragraded rings. Conversely, if uh, gamma is a radical in the category of paragraded rings, then there exists a general class of paragraded modules sigma such that uh, gamma coincides with the uh, sigma radical. And now I won't tell only something about I will need uh, not uh, uh, tell nothing. I will uh, not tell anything about uh, special rings. I will tell something about normal ring radicals. If A is a paragraded ring, a paragraded radical gamma is called paragraded left strong. If I from gamma implies I contain or equal gamma A for uh, uh, all left ideals I from A. Let uh, A and B be paragraded rings with the paragrading sets delta and delta prime respectively. Also, let uh, V be uh, paragraded A minus B B module, module and uh, W uh, paragraded B minus A B module with the paragrading set uh, D and D prime respectively. A Morita context uh, A V W B is called a paragraded Morita context if uh, for each delta D, D, D from D, uh, uh, for uh, each delta prime from delta prime and for each delta prime from delta prime uh, exist, uh, there exist uh, delta from delta such that V D, D uh, times uh, W D prime is contained or equal uh, A delta and similar for uh, uh, W now we have uh, one uh, important th uh, theorem. Let A, V, W, B be a Marita context. Then R equal uh, matrix uh, A, V, W, B is paragraded ring. A radical gamma of paragraded rings is called paragraded normal if uh, V gamma of B times W uh, is contained or equal gamma of A for every paragraded Morita context, A, V, W, B. Now we have uh, some uh, 
propositions and uh, one theorem. If uh, gamma is paragraded uh, a normal uh, radical, then gamma is left and right strong. We say that uh, a paragraded radical gamma is paragraded pa uh, principally left hereditary if A from gamma implies A times uh, little a element gamma for every homogeneous element A from A. Every proposition, every paragraded normal radical gamma is paragraded principally left hereditary and principally right hereditary theorem. A paragraded radical gamma is paragraded normal if and only if gamma is paragraded left strong and the paragraded principally left hereditary or paragraded right strong and paragraded principally right hereditary nigh. Now we, you can see uh, bibliography. Burbaki, Shadira, Albertstadt, Herstein, Ilich, Georgievich, uh, two families, uh, one family is family of his father, the other is family of his uh, mother. He is not uh, Rus Russian. Um, but uh, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, he, uh, he uh, is my pupil. And uh, we made many, we obtained many results. So, uh, then Mark Rasner is uh, uh, very interesting and uh, very important uh, uh, papers uh, concerning uh, uh, graded rings and graded structures. Uh, uh, Mark Rasner, uh, my uh, joint papers with Mark Rasner published uh, in, the, in uh, uh, monograph uh, Queen's papers in pure and applied mathematics, uh, uh, structural paragraded groups, uh, rings modules, first, second, uh, and the uh, third uh, published in uh, Proceedings of Japan Academy of Sciences. Uh, uh, and uh, now there are many, there are many new, uh, new uh, papers about non-commutative rings, uh, uh, radicals of paragraded rings. Uh, uh, this is uh, a part of this uh, big uh, paper, paragraded, uh, dedicated to uh, Alexander Vasilievich Mikhailov, paragraded rings and some open questions, uh, Brown McCoy radical of paragraded rings, uh, pardon, I beg pardon, radical of paragraded rings is dedicated to uh, Kurosh and uh, Krasner. They was uh, big uh, friends and uh, big mathematicians too. Uh, this uh, new paragrade uh, radicals of uh, concerning uh, uh, brown mccoy radicals it seems uh, uh, paragraded rings not this uh, paragraded rings i don't see now this paper it was but no i finished i want to tell uh, thank you to all I'm, uh, I want to tell that uh, I uh, was ed educated in different uh, cities of Yugoslavia, in uh, Varaždin, Croatia, Maribor, Slovenia, in uh, Bo Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, uh, my uh, scientific, uh, scientific papers are of fundamental nature and can be derived into two circles, abstract analysis and algebra. Uh, and algebra, I especially emphasize uh, uh, the second group of papers that uh, represent uh, the crown of my scientific work in them together with Mark Krasner, famous French mathematicians I introduced and led the foundations of uh, a new and abstract theory of paragraded structures, which is a generalization of the corresponding Burbaki Krasner's uh, um, structures. It is safe to say that I, in addition to the connection with the Kurosh famous Russian school of algebra, 
I educated also at Lomonosov, Moscow State University, where I was uh, first one year and after many times. I am double theory to one of the oldest and most famous French school, school of mathematics, both through analysis and the well-known Belgrade School of Anal Analysis of Mikhail Petrovich Alas and through algebra and Mark Trasner. Thank you very much. My talk was uh, Thank you of the speaker uh, for the paragraded, paragraded links. Any questions or remarks? My introduction was uh, big because it is uh, not a well known theory. Paragraded links uh, are uh, not uh, uh, very known. And uh, I must to tell uh, many definitions. But I have afraid that it was not uh, very <laughs> under that was not understand that uh, um, is uh, not uh, understanding. Yes, but uh, uh, it's very interesting topic. Indeed. I have a question. Yes, um, please. So, graded rings uh, naturally appear in. Uh, algebraic geometry. Uh, for example, these are the ring of functions of projective varieties. So I was wondering uh, if you know of any applications of paragraded rings to geometry or other fields. I'm sorry not. Uh, this will be very interesting. This is new theory and uh, I, um, I begin uh, before war in uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, I a long time don't work, but uh, now I have many, many to work and I have not the time, but uh, it will be, it would be very interesting because I know uh, uh, geometry also. I was uh, assistant uh, at uh, University of Sarajevo uh, after finished, uh, after completed my study and I, uh, uh, was assistant not only for algebra, but also for analysis, for geometry. Uh, 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 and uh, I know something about this, uh, but uh, I have no the time. I have many, uh, many, many uh, works which uh, I uh, must finish. Yeah. Well, it's, it's something to be explored. For some yes. new, some uh, young uh, pupil. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank and you. Uh, I love your uh, your uh, uh, your uh, um, country. I was once in uh, uh, in uh, Bulgaria, Bulgaria. I was in uh, Sofia, in Varna too. In this time was uh, Andrei Todorov, uh, was Vucezar Avramov, uh, Prozdena Todorova also. Uh, they was my friend. I know some, I think uh, Boris and Maya, Maya also, I don't know, I forgive family name. Uh, your country is uh, very nice, was very nice. And uh, I have some friend from I'm sorry, but Andrei Todorov died. I think that he's not. Yeah. He was. Well, we, we, we would like to have you here very soon after the end of the pandemic, hopefully. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And you also, uh, we uh, celebrate uh, 70 years of our Academy of Sciences and uh, your um, president uh, or uh, vice president, I don't know who. Uh, wanted to come here, but uh, now we have a phrase because uh, there are many people which is uh, uh, which uh, which is uh, bolestan. I don't know how to tell this. Sick, yeah, yeah. Yes, Sick, and yeah. Uh, uh, we will uh, celebrate in uh, 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 next year yeah. now our our uh, jubilee. Our jubilee. I know better French, uh, Russian, German also, but uh, uh, I 
I don't speak long time English because uh, I uh, lived in the, a long time in Paris, in uh, Moscow, and uh, I have uh, one aunt. My aunt is Esther Eicherin from Austria, and uh, I know these three languages better. I, I know also Slovenian language because I was, uh, oh. I go to school in Slovenia in Maribor. But I don't see uh, your uh, guest, uh, uh, your lecturer, uh, Dernoshek. Dernoshek, I think Dernoshek. This, is, this was not interesting, I think, for her because uh, uh, her uh, lecture is different, very different of mine. Other questions, please? Thank you very much once more, once more for uh, invitation and uh, Come to Sarajevo. Sarajevo is very interesting. It's not so nice at its war, as it was before war. But thank you. It is nice. Thank you, thank you, thank you also. For the thank you very much. Discussion in the talk. Thank you. See you.